He found the body naked, face down in the park, exactly where the college student said it would be. Pieces of bone stuck out the sides of the mouth like mandibles. The arms were twisted and broken to resemble antenna. Other body parts from a second body sewn on haphazardly, but also with the craftsmanship of a surgeon were sticking out from the abdomen and waist, bent up to mimic the legs of a stick insect. The bottom half was just as grotesque, legs bent backwards with bones protruding the kneecaps and thighs, bits of teeth designed to replicate a hardened shell upon the man's back. Perhaps the worst part was that he had no skin. He had been stripped down to the muscle like a piece of meat. And then it was used as sort of a leathery exoskeleton for the torso to cover up the features. My partner excused himself to vomit the moment he saw the nightmarish abomination, but all that concerned me was the latest clue. Written in the victim's blood was the Latin name of the newest species to enter the collection. Andule Uverendus. Likely telling me that the deceased was a priest of some kind. This would make five in under two months that we had attempted to tackle. None of them solved. All of them related to the mysterious serial killer who left only these tags as a moniker. It was clear that his M.O. resonated with the most sickening deformations of the human body, and also a love for insects in general, thus why the media had assigned him such a casual name. But each time I came to one of those crime scenes, it felt more like a taunt. I'm a damn good detective. But this was the work of a true madman. So far, only two of the victims marched with missing persons in the tri-state county, which meant he was careful and meticulous. Our county profiler said that it was likely he studied his prey for months before choosing to attack. Because there was never a shred of blood that linked back to anyone outside of the crime scene, not a piece of skin, not even a hair follicle, this sicko was a ghost and he knew it. Now with bodies stitched together and put on display, he was getting bolder. That actually made me a little excited because a criminal that takes more and more risks is also prone to making mistakes. The ME showed up about 15 minutes later and confirmed this with a quick swab around the bones that were sticking from the victim's jaws. These aren't human, he said. What are, what are they then? I asked. Afraid I'm not quite sure. Seem to be from some large dog, possibly a mastiff, he suggested. Dogs like that are rare around here. There's a chance it belonged to someone. And if so, likely would have a tracker installed, I said excitedly. It was the first lead that we had. I tried to keep my spirits from soaring. I didn't want to jinx this into being a red herring. Sure enough, the next day the report came back and confirmed it. A man by the name of Julian West had owned the animal. Looks like this fellow's a bit of a recluse, Joseph. My partner commented after doing a quick internet search. According to the limited data he had dug up, Julian was a businessman from outside of New Orleans, one that had retired a few years back after an unfortunate accident. Now he rarely ever came out in public, and he lived in a more remote portion of the Louisiana Bayou. We attempted to make contact several times that day with no result. Our only option was to drive out to speak with Mr. West and see what information he could provide. We should go tonight, while this is still fresh, Joseph suggested. My date had already canceled for the night, so I obliged him, and we made the road trip in a little under an hour. When we finally did arrive, I felt a bit intimidated at the size of Mr. West's house. It reminded me of a southern gothic, Downton Abbey, sprawling and dominating every part of the bayou around us. Joseph hopped out and buzzed the front gate as I kept staring at the dimly lit windows. It was hard to believe that he lived here alone, but the entire place gave me the vibe of a haunted house. Once inside the vestibule, we moved up to the front door and I pressed the ring doorbell before commenting. Well, at least we know he's not technologically impaired. The webcam activated before my partner could get a reply and a sharp, hoarse voice asked, Who is it? Detectives Arlington and Trent, we're here to ask you a couple of questions about your missing pet. It's concerning a homicide, I said, waving my badge at the camera. There was a short pause and then the voice barked, Come into my parlor! 
The door creaked open to reveal a dusty and undisturbed hallway. Joseph took out his flashlight and illuminated our steps. Kind of creepy, he admitted, as he walked into the wide foyer. Massive spiderwebs hung from the pillars. There was little to no sign of life anywhere. I'll check upstairs. You take the first floor, I told him. He nodded, too freaked out to argue. I made my way to the top of the stairs. There was a portrait of Mr. West hanging there in what I assumed was the prime of his youth. He looked happy and content. Of course, it was hard to tell since the majority of the painting was thrashed and scratched up like a wild animal had been set loose. Have you ever heard the story of Dorian Gray? A voice asked, breaking my reverie. It was coming from the nearby bedroom. There wasn't a speck of light as I approached the shadowy entrance. The voice added, Please keep it dark. I'm not a fan of the light any longer. The accident scarred my corneas. I obliged him and stepped inside the room. Dorian Gray was a fictional character. He had a magical portrait. He kept him young forever as long as he didn't look at it, I said, answering his initial inquiry. In some ways, I have sheltered myself here from the world for the same reason. I feel like if I were to expose myself, then the facade would make everything crumble, he rasped. Is that what you hope to hide? I asked. I believe you suspect the answer to that, detective. And now that I have you where I want you, why don't you see for yourself, he remarked. I hesitated, a sense of foreboding overwhelming my body. But still I chose to raise the light up and peer at him. It was not the nightmare I expected. But it was something far worse. The man that was Julian West was gone. That much was clear in the faint light. In his place was an amalgamation of bodies sewn together to form a mixed-up Frankenstein-esque monster. He now had four arms emerging from his chest and twisted together to form a praying mantis-like pincers, and six separated legs protruding from his lower body, the way that a massive scorpion would. He even had the tail of such a creature, except except that he seemed to be pieced together by the bones and tissues of other victims. My god, man, I said in shock. He smiled broadly, showing his extra rows of teeth as he cackled. You must know by now why I brought you here, if not to showcase my collection. I felt my feet fall from under me, like some kind of trap door was sprung. Then my hands and legs became entangled in a mess of silk and drool. It was another massive spiderweb, and below me, I saw a pile of corpses, except, except they weren't dead at all. These were more abominations that West had made in this dreadful hell, all shrieking and clamoring towards me, the way a shark would for a meal. I struggled to free myself, my firearm falling from my belt as I began to run. I scrambled up the side of the pit, using bits of bone that were sticking out to escape. One of the creatures latched on, its fangs piercing my neck as I flung it away and raced to the door. I shouted out to Joseph as West continued to cackle with glee. You're too late now. These beautiful creations have already spread far beyond these walls. Soon all the world will be part of my display, he shouted madly. I tripped to the entrance, falling straight into the open cavity of my partner. A million maggots burst from his skin, having devoured him in mere minutes as I pushed back and fled in terror. I didn't stop running until I made it ten miles down the road. And then I contacted my precinct captain to have a warrant for the house. Joseph's death was the nail in the coffin. We went to raid the house less than three hours later, but as we drove up, I saw... I saw it amid the trees, a glow of embers. The mansion was ablaze. It took another hour to douse the fire, and we, we initially found hundreds of massive moltings and skins from the creatures. Guess he decided to end it after all, my captain told me. But I wasn't so sure because of something else I found amidst the wreckage. Or rather, what I realized was missing. The portrait. He was still out there somewhere. I scratched the back of my neck where the creature had bit me and I... I winced. Then amidst the burnt remains of Joseph's body, 
I saw that familiar tag the serial killer used. The upper portion of my partner was missing, was ripped away like a prize would be by a toy crane. Another addition to the collection. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Goofy Pasta. I want to tell you thank you so much for watching today's video on YouTube or listening to today's episode of the podcast on the podcast. For those of you guys who like listening to me here, maybe you like listening to me do behind the scenes shit uh, stuff. You can always do that at twitch.tv slash Mr. Creepypasta. I Twitch stream sometimes. And when I Twitch stream, it's usually either playing very random video games or doing work like you're currently hearing me do right now. I always love seeing you guys. I always love hearing from you guys. So if you wanted to pop in and listen to me work or pop in and backseat game, then hey, you're always welcome to do so. I always appreciate a follow there. And of course, like always, I want to give a very big thank you to everybody who supports me at patreon.com slash Mr. Creepypasta. You guys, as always, are the main MVPs of this story, of every night's story, and you guys help me keep the lights on here. So, without further ado, I want to give a very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tanya Oren, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, That One Guy, Lupita Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Tyler Fletcher, Rebecca Harper, Murky Moo, Red Shadow Cat, Xavier the Cheyenne, Demix, Sean Caddo Baker, Six Gay Rats in a Trench Coat, Turtle Man, Rob Like Sharp Things, Chaos Art, Cryolinian, Milk and Meal, Zachary Graphius, Gorang Tramagasi, Maria Walker, Pain Gravy, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Aka Limchok, Dirt Diver, Matt Bach, Jabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, Nick Weaver, Deleted Account, Melted Lake, Tolly Sue, Guy Mara Ravenswood, William King, Darth Miver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Sashi Suzaku, Croconut 509, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Kaylee Ambrose, Suji Campbell, Trickin, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Nicholas Zaccardi, Happy Birthday, Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiwi the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lampshade, Guy Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, and Corey Kenshin. As always, thank you guys so very, very much. Thank all of you who are in the description down below, and honestly, thank all of you that can give anything, even when it comes down to just $1. I appreciate you guys very, very much. Sweet dreams.